Welcome to another true crime story time, where I tell you guys one true crime case that was solved using forensic science all while doing, that's right, my makeup. All the products I'm using in this video will be linked in the description below. Please read a disclaimer, I am not a professional forensic pathologist, nor am I a professional makeup artist. I am just the average girl at home, like you, planning my makeup and talking about a true crime case. So if that's something you're into, then you're more than welcome to stick around and hit the subscribe button. Also, quick reminder, the comment section is a privilege. Don't fuck it up. Now let's get into today's case. And if I come back to you guys with a different outfit on, it's because I ran out of time and I had to leave. So this story all takes place in Puerto Penasco. Penasco? I was never good at geography. I'll put it on the screen. That place, Mexico, where Dan and Tris Willoughby, along with their three children, were vacationing. They were on their annual family winter vacation. It was nearing the end of the vacation. It was about, they had been there for about several days now. So they wanted to get in as much as they could, as much sightseeing and stuff as they could in their final days there. So Dan decided he wanted to take the children out on kind of a little field trip. And is it a field trip when your parents take you? I don't know. But anyway, Dan decided to take his kids to one of the field museums that was nearby. Unfortunately, that day, Trish was not feeling well. She actually had a headache. Headaches are terrible, dude. I used to suffer from these really terrible migraines. The migraines were so bad, you guys. It was to the point where half of my body would go numb. Like, you know how you can't see and all that happened? Like, and I couldn't think properly. I couldn't form words. My sentences and speech would be off. Like, it was really bad. Thank God um, I don't really experience those that much anymore, only when I'm around family members for whatever reason. I know that sounds really bad, but uh, it's true for whatever reason. Anyway, this is not about my freaking migraines and headaches. Trish was having a really bad headache. She was complaining that she had been suffering from a headache all day and she just really wasn't feeling well. She wasn't feeling up to it. Um, so she decided to stay behind in their vacation home and rest. She wanted to take a nap. She figured she'd be able to, you know, sleep it off, right? Two hours later, Dan and the children return from the museum and the younger two kids hop out of the car and they go inside the home first. They enter their mother's bedroom and that is when they make a horrific discovery. Trish is laying in the bed with a towel over her head, she is bleeding and she is barely moving, right? Okay, so much for that nap, right? Pfft. Terrified, the children run out of the home, they grab their father and they're telling him, dad, dad, you know, mom is laying in the bed with a towel over her head and she's bleeding and she is breathing funny and we don't know what's wrong with her and they're crying they're upset obviously because they just found their mother uh, severely wounded so dan tells the children to wait outside while he goes inside to check on trish that is when he also discovers trish moments later dan returns to the porch with his children he says a quick prayer with his children before calling 911 which okay sir i don't all right these people with these prayers these days like it's really like what is that about? Mexican authorities arrive on the scene as well as paramedics and they take Trish to the nearest hospital. Authorities question Dan and the children while Trish is being treated in the hospital. Several hours later, Trish was pronounced dead due to blunt force trauma to the head. Did not mean for that to rhyme. I'm not trying to be funny or disrespectful, okay? But that's what happened, guys. Don't start making beats for, for, my, for my words, okay? Don't do that. It was clear that this was no accident. Something sinister had occurred while Dan and the children were out. But who would have wanted to harm Trish? And why? Investigators questioned family members and friends and they all had nothing bad to say about Trish. They said she was a very kind, warm, loving woman who was very accepting. They said that she was an amazing mom and 
a very good uh, business partner. People always wanted to be around Trish because she was just like the one to light up the room. She was so kind and sweet to everyone that most people remembered her by her smile. An autopsy report revealed large bruises on Trish's abdominal area and she had been hit more than nine times over the head. <laughs> I'm struggling. This knife looked like a butter knife and that to me is like even more mortifying and investigators did find that knife inside of the home. A search of the home revealed that Trish was missing some expensive item. Her wedding ring was missing and an expensive pearl necklace that she had. Right off the bat, it appeared as though it was a robbery gone wrong. And to be honest with you, Mexican police did not have the resources to fully investigate the crime scene. It was said that they didn't even have a fingerprinting kit. I mean, that's a real ratchet police department right there. You ain't got even a fingerprint kit, sir. Sir, it's time to go back to the U.S. I mean, it's really hard because like on the one hand, I you want to blame the police department for that. But then on the other hand, some countries just do not have the funds like that. And that's that's what I find really sad. Um, I would hope that other. Ooh, what did I just do? Oh, my God. Uh, oops. I think that considering the fact that she is American, that she's from the U.S., that the U.S. would step in and kind of. I don't know, take over the investigation because these people over here even got a fingerprinting kit. Yes, I'm judging, sorry, but I am. I mean, just like a basic, simple fingerprinting kit. Like I'm I'm confused, Some we gotta help them then. We gotta give them something. Now the town over from the town where the Willoughby's were vacationing was considered a very, very poor town. Most of the people there were in like they were living in absolute poverty, let's just say that. Now, I forgot to mention this, but also missing from the Willoughby's place was $400 in cash. They were thinking the jewelry plus $400 in cash in that country would make a significant difference in the average family's life. They said that it would be something like the equivalent to six months worth of income. I mean, that would be a pretty good motive for robbery. I know that I look like I just got out of the grave, but don't worry, we're gonna fix that in a second here. Now, according to Dan, he told investigators that one of the employees working on the resort where the Willoughby's were staying told him that they saw a strange man kind of lurking around the property. When the Willoughby family returned to their hometown of Gilbert, Arizona, they were shocked to find that Trisha's story had made the news. Even though in the, 90, in the 90s, it was a pretty different time than it is today. And I can only imagine back then, you know, a white woman that, you know, gets brutally murdered in this foreign country of Mexico. Like, I can just imagine all of the gossip and and things being said and stuff swarming about that. Now, there was one good thing that came out of that article. It prompted a lot of Trisha's neighbors to come forward with some interesting information. I would actually rephrase that and say some very damning information, particularly about Dan. Concerned neighbors came forward to speak to investigators regarding the Willoughby's relationship. Although Trish and Dan had what seemed to be a picture perfect relationship and family dynamic, that wasn't exactly what was going down in the house for real, okay? I guess every family has its secrets, but I mean, this wasn't really no secret because everybody in the dang neighborhood knew and they all was coming for saying that basically Dan had been having an affair with another woman. And not only that, but that Trish knew about this other woman and it had been going on for quite some time. The woman was 34 year old Yesenia Pantino. She was a Mexican native. I see that's why he wanted to go to Mexico. Investigators did a background check into Yesenia and they found out that Yesenia was an opportunist. Or I guess to put it plainly, she was a gold digger. 
that's how the officer said it. Yusinia would target men for money to fuel her lifestyle. Once she had drained them dry, once she had drained them of all the cash flow that they had and they were dried up, she would then break up with them and go on to the next guy. Dan was a successful 50 year old businessman. He worked as a sales manager for an international freight company. He was making pretty good money. But Trish, she was making even more money than Dan because Trish owned a very lucrative herbal company with her mother. Her company did over millions in sales. They were kind of a power couple. Now Yusinia, she came from a family of farm laborers. Her family immigrated to the United States in 1962 when Yusinia was just six years old. Yusinia first met Dan in Mesa, Arizona while waiting on a bus. Now, according to Yesenia, she was with a friend of hers while waiting on this bus and she was pacing up and down the street and while she was doing that, she began to open a Reese's peanut butter cup and as she's opening or unwrapping the candy, a car drives by and it's a Jaguar and Dan is driving the Jaguar. I know she was like, mm-hmm. From then on, her sights were set on Dan. Right as Yanessa is about to throw her wrapper onto the ground, Dan approaches her and he jokingly said something along the lines of no littering, which opened up conversation for the two. Really? Is that your pickup line, sir? You better come at me with something more than that. I mean, really didn't take a lot for Yanessa to get interested, huh? The Jaguar did most of the work on her. Yanessa was with her friend and Dan offered to give them a ride to the local mall. It was the 90s, you guys. That's what, that's what we were doing back then. Now you can't catch me dead in a mall, I'm telling you. So depressing and boring every time I go to a mall. Maybe it's just that I haven't been to a good one in a really long time, I don't know. He gave Yanessa his number and invited her out for drinks a couple of days later. Now, okay, sir, you got children and a wife at home. I don't know what you're doing out in the streets. Dan, what are you doing? A few days later, they met up for drinks and Dan told Yanessa all about, you know, his business ventures and what he did. Of course, this got Yanessa even more excited um, and interested in him because of all of the business that he did. Dan told Yanessa all about his company and how he was looking to expand his company's contacts. He said he had worked with some Spanish speaking companies before and he was looking to expand his business south of the border. So he offered Yanessa a job as his Spanish instructor. And a couple of weeks later, he introduces her to his family as his Spanish instructor. Can you imagine his wife's reaction? action i mean at this point she probably didn't know yet but i'd have been like uh oh, okay as dan and yanessa's relationship grew they began spending more time together taking vacations to mexico and other countries they were going all over the place dan was really spoiling yanessa at this point he was buying her all types of gifts expensive gifts he began paying for Yanessa's bills and lifestyle. It wasn't long before he moved her into a new apartment. And get this, you guys, the apartment was only a half a block away from his home with his family. Yeah, balls. That's all I can say. The man has balls. I'm sorry, I may have gotten a little bit excited. It was a half a mile up the road from his family's home not a half a block girl because we was about to a new home girl would have been i'm really not feeling blush on the nose anymore are you guys still doing that are we still doing the lunette the clown blush on the nose thing i don't know guys sometimes i do it and then sometimes i'm like eh, i'm kind of over it i'm not really feeling that let me know in the comments down below. It was only a matter of time before Trish became aware that Dan and Yanessa was having an affair. And not only that, but that Dan was now using her money to fund Yanessa's lifestyle, to pay her bills, her rent, her nails, clothes, all of these things that he was doing for Yanessa. He was using Trish's money to do that. I mean, sir. Can we talk for a second? Because that is unacceptable. 
You see, Dan had lost his job at the freight company at this point, and Trish became enraged when she found out that she was the one paying for Yanessa's rent. I would too, girl, I would've been the girl. For obvious reasons, Trish became enraged. She no longer wanted to support Dan's affair with this other woman and she definitely did not want to be paying for her rent. One day she went to Yanessa's apartment and she confronted Yanessa at the poolside at Yanessa's apartment building and she started accusing her of having an affair with Dan and started you know going off on her and she was obviously upset and she made a big scene at the poolside and her and Yanessa kind of got into it. Because of all of this that came out, investigators wanted to speak with Yanessa. They wanted to find out where she was and what she was doing on the day of Trisha's murder. Because could this be a motive? During her interview, Yanessa admitted to the affair with Dan. It's weird because she actually appeared to be quite proud of what she had done, which is, I feel like, is very rare or should be a rare thing. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be exactly excited to ruin somebody's family or marriage like that. Like if it happened like, oops, like I'm, you know, I'm sorry, bro, but I wouldn't be happy about it. It seemed like she was pretty proud of her work and what she had done. So she said that they were in fact having an affair and that they loved each other and that Dan would buy her all sorts of things, uh, vacations, gifts, you name it, he would get it for her. However, she denied having anything to do with Trisha's murder. In fact, she said she wasn't even in Mexico the time of the murder. Investigators describe Yanessa as a very interesting character. They said that during the interview that Yanessa exuded some very inappropriate behaviors. Um, she was flirting with the investigators, which is like, girl, the audacity. One of the investigators said that during the interrogation, Yanessa leaned into him and said, I know what a man wants. I know what a man likes. The officer was kind of like, okay, that's a little flirtatious. That's a little weird. When investigators asked Yanessa for a valid identification, she presented them with a social security card with the name Alfredo Pantino on it. Curious, investigators ask, you know, who, who the heck is Alfredo Pantino? And that is when Yanessa reveals that Alfredo Pantino is actually herself that that was her name before her corrective surgery. They did a background check and sure enough, Yanessa was formerly known as Alfredo Pantino. And they were no stranger to police. Alfredo had a rap sheet for male escorting. My goddamn neighbors, y'all. Now it's time to go into the palette. But anyway, back to the story. With further investigation, detectives learned that Dan had a secret joint account with Yanessa. As they were looking through his bank account information, they discovered that he had actually made a large purchase on a set of his and hers matching diamond engagement rings. I'm confused. I'm confused. Were they married? I'm confused, babe. I'm, I'm not the only one that's confused because I know they're not married. You guys, you guys, they had been engaged since the fall of 1990. That's right. They weren't just dating. They weren't just having an affair. They were actually engaged to be married. This was around the time that Trish had confronted Yanessa. It's funny because that year, Trish had discovered that Dan and Yanessa was having an affair and she confronted them. And they pretty much told her that that was not true, that they were just teacher and student. They only had a teacher and student relationship. I mean, gaslighting, just gaslighting this woman all the way through this affair. It was terrible. Yesenia, I keep calling this girl Yanessa and I realize that I've done that. For like the entire video and her name is actually Yesenia. I think I started off calling her the correct name but then somewhere in between we got all twisted up 
and somehow I landed on Yanessa instead of Yesenia. But I want to make a point to correct myself. Her name is Yesenia, not Yanessa. So just strike that from the records. Okay, thank you. Continue. Investigators discovered that Dan was due to inherit several million dollars from Trish's life insurance policy. Could this have been a motive to want Trish dead? Possibly, I'd say. Several million dollars? Dude, you could do a lot. Now we in a big boy ballpark. This ain't no little hundred thousand dollar. Okay. Now, now we talk. For obvious reasons, investigators had to speak with Dan, so they brought him down into the station for questioning. During the interview, at first, Dan appeared to be this grief-stricken husband who was, you know, just all upset about his wife's death. And Dan had a very different story to tell than Yanessa. He said that he hadn't in fact been having an affair with Yanessa or anyone else for that matter. He said that he didn't have any sort of relationship outside of a professional one and he insisted that he was happily married. When confronted with the fact that he would inherit several thousand dollars from his wife's death, Dan's demeanor changed quickly. He began to sweat and he became visibly shaken up and ill. He acknowledged the fact that he was the beneficiary of his wife's life insurance policy and he was to inherit around several million dollars. But he said that he didn't kill his wife and that he didn't have an affair with anyone. Obviously this man is a liar. Police had no scientific evidence at this point linking either of the two to Trisha's death. So they did what any good police task force would do and they returned to the scene of the crime. So they traveled to Mexico to take a look at the crime scene themselves and to collect any additional information that would help point them to the killer. And they did. They were able to collect prints that was left on the door handle at the crime scene and a Coca-Cola bottle that was left on the kitchen counter. It was a Diet Coke bottle, in case anybody's wondering. Don't mess with the Diet Coke clan, I'm telling you. The people out there that love Diet Coke, they love Diet Coke. Like it's always gotta be diet. I'm like, why? They sent the prints off to the forensics lab for testing. In the meantime, they still had Yesenia at their police station. At the police station, they searched Yesenia's purse and they found two rings that they believed belonged to Trish. They found a diamond ring and a pearl ring. Vanessa started to get a little bit nervous and at this point, she admits to police that she was in fact in Mexico at the time of the murder that weekend, but that she was there with friends to party or something like that. But she said that she had nothing to do with Trisha's murder. When they questioned her about the ring, she said that she had purchased the two rings from an unknown man that was selling jewelry on the beach. Girl, please. We do not believe you. We don't. We don't. It just so happened that the day she purchased these rings were the same day that Trish was murdered. I think she thought that she was giving herself an alibi by saying that, oh, I, w I purchased these rings on the beach and I, I, and I bought them from this guy that was on the beach, but I don't know who he is. Uh, that would place her with some sort of alibi, but um, she was wrong because nobody knew who that guy was. They couldn't find him and she herself said she had no idea who he was. So she could have very well have been making it up, which that's what police suspected. So I don't know what she was thinking. That's definitely not a clear, solid alibi girl. During their investigation, they learned that Yesenia had an existing warrant for adjourning jurisdiction. So Mesa police arrest her on that charge, hoping that that would buy them some time to get an additional information, like, you know, the prints. They were kind of waiting for those print results to come back to see if they belonged to her. Now, in the meantime, they bring in Trisha's mother, who is able to identify the rings as her daughter's, Trish. The prints on the Coke bottle and the door came back, and guess what, you guys? They matched. The prints belong to none other than Yesenia. Now investigators had the physical evidence they needed to bring charges against Yesenia. But there was only one problem. Yesenia had been released from Mesa police and she was nowhere to be found. She had disappeared. Friends and family members covered the borders of Mexico with posters of Yesenia hoping that someone would 
see her, recognize her, and call the cops. Trisha's mother went to the media for help. She did a TV interview which finally paid off when Crime Stoppers received a phone call from an anonymous person saying that they had seen Yanessa working in a bar in Mexico. Yanessa was caught. And this time she confessed to everything. She told investigators that it all started about three months before Trisha's murder when she gave Dan an ultimatum. It was either her or Trish. She wanted him to get a divorce. She told him to divorce his wife or it was over between them. According to Yanessa, a few days later, Dan presented her with an alternative plan. And I mean, what do you guys think that plan was? Ugh. They were on their way to the gym when he began to discuss murdering his wife. She said that she was initially shocked and she told him, no, are you crazy? We can't do that, just divorce her. But Dan said it would be better to kill Trish because then he would receive the life insurance policy money and that they could move away to Mexico together. Did we forget about the kids that you have over here, sir? What were you gonna do with them? Were they gonna go to Mexico too? I mean, what was this man really thinking? Like, what was his plan? I don't think he had a real solid thought out plan. Yesenia pointed to Dan being the mastermind behind Trisha's horrific murder. When investigators spoke to the children, they painted a completely different story than the one that their father, Dan, had painted. According to Dan's 17-year-old daughter, Marsha, on the day of the murder, after everyone had packed into the car, all the children and Dan were in the car ready to go, Dan all of a sudden said that he had to go back in the house and he told the children to wait there in the car. After about 10 minutes, Marsha got hungry and she decided to go back into the house for a candy bar. She went up to the door and she tried to open it, but it was locked. So then she knocked and her father answered the door and he told her to go back and wait in the car. He wouldn't let her inside the house. Proof that Dan was inside the house with Trish right before her murder. In fact, he was the last one known to be with Trish right before her murder. Police believe that that was the reason that Dan sent the children inside of the house when they had returned from the museum that day. He wanted them to find their mother first, which is how, how, and why would you ever, ever want your children to see that? I mean, it's like, not only did he not care about Trish, but he obviously did not care about these kids either. Yanessa went on trial in Mexico and she was convicted of Trish's murder and sentenced to 35 years in prison. Um, different country, different rules. I don't know why she didn't get a life sentence. I guess she was considered a co-conspirator. I don't know, but she should have got a life sentence. Dan's trial was due to take place in Arizona and because they only had circumstantial evidence against him, they needed Yanessa to testify on their behalf. So the prosecution offered Yanessa a deal. I guess that's how she got the 35 years instead of a life sentence. Guys, I had no idea what I was doing with this look and I think it's apparent. I just saw like some goth girls doing some stuff and I'm like, that looks cute for all my goth babes out there, but then I try it and it looks like trash, I don't know. If you're a goth girly, write in the comments down below, like, I don't know, what, how to help me. <laughs> Dan went on trial for first degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder. He was facing the death sentence. On the stand, Yanessa assassinated Dan's character. She told the court exactly what she had told investigators, that Dan was the mastermind behind Trish's murder and that she was just a co-conspirator. She said she had pleaded with Dan to just get a divorce, but he did not want to do that. He wanted to kill Trish. Now, Dan, he was facing a death sentence and he was found guilty of Trisha's murder and was sentenced to death. Now, as you know, a death sentence doesn't automatically mean that the person is going to die tomorrow, the next day, not even next week or not even next month. Most times, death sentences take a couple of years. They'll sit there for years before they actually are put to death. Dan continued to maintain his innocence and a couple of months later, he appealed his case. He claimed he was denied access to proper effective counsel. He had a shitty lawyer. And because his lawyer was completely incompetent, he was able to get his um, conviction overturned. He won and was granted a retrial. At this point, several years had passed. 
that he had been sitting on death row before this whole retrial came about. Prosecutors now needed to gather more evidence. They needed to go back and find all the evidence from his previous um, case and they had to bring back all of their star witnesses and Yanessa was one of their star witnesses that they had to bring back to the stand. Uh, unfortunately this time when investigators sat down to interview her she was telling a different story than she had told before. Homegirl has switched it up. She was now telling them that she was the one who had murdered Trish and that she did it alone. In fact, he had no idea about it. I know that Dan's defense attorney was jumping up and down in his seats for that boy. So they re-interviewed Yesenia and they asked her to explain to them how she did it. And she said that she had a homemade mace, which looks like a big metal ball that's tied to a string. I didn't even know that. When they said mace, I thought they were talking about like hand spraying mace <laughs> so it's basically a weapon that is similar to a ball and chain except for the chain part were well the one she had the chain part was a rope and it had a big metal ball on the end and she said she walked in and she hit Trish in the face while Trish was laying in the bed and Trish instantly went unconscious and that is how she killed her but that story was not consistent with the forensic evidence, nor was her story consistent with the coroner's report. To find out which of the stories Yanessa was telling was the truth, they brought in a forensic expert named Tom Bevel. Now Tom Bevel, this guy, he wrote the book on blood splatter analysis. He actually, I think, wrote two books. So he, at the time, was one of the lead forensic scientists in his field. After looking at the crime scene photos and studying all of the forensic evidence from the crime scene, he concluded that the first story Yesenia told was more consistent with the forensic evidence. He argued that due to the positioning of Trisha's body on the bed when she had been hit, that there was no way Yesenia could have hit her with the mace the way that she said. Because you see, there was a shelving unit that was about a three foot shelving unit above Trisha's head. If Yesenia hit Trish the way that she said, then she would have broken through that huge shelf, right? Well, she hadn't. The shelf hadn't been touched at all. This was proof that it was not physically possible for Yesenia to hit Trish in the head with the mace the way that she said. Then the coroner gets on the stand and they testify that Yesenia's second story also isn't consistent with the forensic evidence. They say that based on the coroner's report, the object that killed Trish was a linear object not anything like a mace. So I took everything off and I had to redo it because girl, I was not feeling, I was not feeling the Egyptian pyramids on my eyelids, okay? I really wanted that like lightning bolt kind of look and I think, I think we did it. <laughs> Forensic scientist Tom Bevel studied the blood spatter found on the bed sheets. There were two types of spatter that he noticed. Some of the spatter was smooth, round, and circular in shape and others were irregular in shape and coagulated. Now, blood coagulation occurs when blood is exposed to air. It dries up and clots together. Tom Bevel believed that the coagulated blood spatter happened earlier on during Trish's attack, most likely the first few blows to her body, because it had more time to dry and coagulate, whereas the smooth round patterns happened much later on during the attack, approximately 10 minutes later. He concluded that there were two separate attacks on Trish, approximately 10 minutes apart. Now this evidence supported Yesenia's original story. To top off prosecutor's argument, they brought back Dan's 17 year old daughter, Marsha, to testify at his trial. And she remembered something about that day that she hadn't originally remembered before. You see, when she went back to the house to get the candy bar and her father answered the door, he was tucking in his shirt and he was wearing a different shirt than he had been wearing when he was in the car, which meant that he went inside the house and changed his clothes. But why? Why would he need to change his clothes? Another clue to what he had done. All the evidence pointed to Dan and Yesenia committing the murder together. 
Prosecutors believe that Yesenia changed her story the second time around because she was angry at how the prison had been treating her. They wouldn't allow her to keep her rings and jewelry that she had went into prison with, so she was really upset about that because uh, she just felt like it wasn't fair, like they didn't keep their end of the bargain or something like this. It was really, really, really stupid. At this point, girl, like you're in prison for committing murder. Like, who cares about the rings? She still cares about the money. She still cares about the jewelry. Like this woman is, girl, I swear she's on a, she got a one track mind. All you care about is that you didn't get to keep the rings that weren't even yours to begin with that you stole off of this woman after you had murdered her? Girl, ugh, get out of here. I hope she stays in prison for a long time. In a shocking turn of events, Yanessa told the court at Dan's second trial the original story that she had told at the first trial. This was something prosecutors were not expecting and they were shocked, but it, it helped them out a lot. Thanks to forensic science and some good police work, Dan Willoughby was convicted of first degree murder the second time around and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. What did you guys think about this case and my makeup look? Please let me know in the comments down below. If you like videos like these, you can check out my other videos. I'll leave them linked on the screen right here. Like, comment, subscribe, share. Please share because it really helps me out. And I'll see you guys next time with another true crime story time. Bye.